Thank you very much. Uh, the agreement was that uh, I will try to give a kind of little bit, uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I kind of understand that I see it from the future, from the past, that computer scientists are kind of uh, scared from the word cohomology, and the idea was that I'll give a very crash elementary course of 20 minutes just to convince you that this, uh, this is uh, um, nothing more than a first year undergraduate linear algebra. And then uh, now, but what see I happened that the computer scientists are so scared from cohomology that they escaped to Germany. <laughs> they are not here, <laughs> many of them. <laughs> uh, and, I, and it seemed like I have to teach uh, some of the mathematicians who knows about it better than me. Uh, what's cohomology? So I, I still stuck to the original plan, and uh, those who know are welcome to take a little nap for 20 minutes, and then I will. Uh, so. so I really want to to do from the beginning, not assuming any knowledge. You know, the common thing is that you can never underestimate your audience. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, uh, I mean, the message I want to give is, first of all, that it is nothing more than really, if, uh, especially if, uh, if we do it and we'll do it only over F2, the, the finite field of order 2, because then it's simplified thing. We don't have to worry about orientation, etc. And after presenting the basic notions, I will uh, give a little survey of several topics in computer science for which cohomology is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is relevant. Uh, as I say, it's very elementary, but I have to admit that there are, there are a lot of uh, notations here. So I, uh, I would encourage you to take notes if you want, <laughs> uh, so that, uh, uh, because I'm going to define many, many notations. So we, uh, our study, main study of object will be a simplicial complex, a finite simplicial complex, uh, which is nothing more than um, a, uh, then a subset of the power set of some set V. So we have a set V, which is, say, 1 up to n, if you want. And we have a subset, a set of subsets of V, satisfying that if F is in the collection and G is a subset of F, then G is also in X, so this is a collection of subsets of V closed under inclusion. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of defining simplicial complex in a very formal, uh, formal way. The, the, so, uh, so such F in X is called a cell or a face. The dimension of, of the face F is the size of F minus 1. So if f is, and, and, and uh, we, we will assume that every one of the set of, of size 1 is indeed in x. Otherwise, we don't care about points which don't appear. Uh, the dimension of f is f minus 1. So if you have one point, then dimension is 1. If you have two points, this is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the dimension is 0. If you have two points, the dimension is 1. So this is an edge. And you have triangles is simply sets of size 3, which are part of the collection. So the collection can be uh, everything. Uh, 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 it's not necessarily everything. The dimension of x is the maximum of the dimension of f, where f is face in x. By the way, uh, OK, no, let's now let's, let's write, or, or if you want, if we write, say, xi to be the collection of faces in x of dimension i, so the dimension of x is the maximum over all i such that xi is not empty, but xi plus 1 is empty. And uh, 
And so we assume, if you remember, that x0 is exactly v. And don't forget that we also have x minus 1. What is x minus 1? So usually the answer, this is the empty set. No, that's not true. The x minus 1 is the set containing the empty set. Because, right? Because the empty set, that's going to be very important. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the empty set, don't laugh, it's going to be important. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the empty set is, is part of the collection by definition because it's a subset of, of some, OK, I didn't say that x is a non-empty collection. <laughs> Uh, so x minus 1 is the set containing the empty, the empty set. OK, now given f uh, in x, we can define the boundary and co-boundary of f. So the boundary of f will be the sig, oh, eh, sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to define first. The, uh, let's define now. Ci. Now C, these are the chain. Ci, x, f2, that we usually will just write Ci. This is the vector space spanned by xi. So the vector space over f2 spanned by xi. We take it a formal sums of elements of of a, of a, a, a formal, formal uh, sum of, of i-dimensional cells. And this is a vector space. And C upper i will be the set of all functions from xi to fi, which is, if you want, it's the dual space to C lower i. But sometimes it'd be convenient to confuse between the two and to identify them. Because basically, if you take, what is this? This is a function which is getting just 0, 1 value. So it's really an indicator function of some subset. And you can think of both of them as the, of all possible subsets of, of, X, of Xi. But anyway, sometimes it'd be uh, convenient to distinguish with them, and sometimes it will be convenient to identify them. Depends on the application. So these are chain in the uh, classical language, and these are co-chain. Now <coughs> we have a map, the, the boundary map, which is a map from C from chain to chain. Going down, going downward, the boundary of a of a of a simplex of a, of a, of a face space is also called a simplex cell uh, is what you think is a boundary. What is a boundary of a triangle? Is the formal sum of the edges of of its edges. So uh, so in order to define it, it's enough to define it on. Uh, the generator, so the boundary of f is the sigma over all g inside f such that the size of g is exactly f minus 1 of g, this formal sum of the walls of, of f. Now, what is the co-boundary? The co-boundary defines going from the co-chain to the co-chain going from ci to ci plus 1. So it goes upward. And the co-boundary, so we could define it in a two-way. I, I, I prefer to say, let's take by, uh, I have a function. And what is a delta of, uh, so uh, I can define it like that. Uh, OK, maybe I'll do, do it in both ways. So, so if we think of, of, uh, of, if we think of the uh, co-chain, if exactly as chains, namely exactly as the vector space of all the subsets. So it's spanned by the cell. So it's enough to define a linear map on the basis. So delta of f will be the sum over all g containing f, such the size of g is f plus 1 of g. 
right? So this is like for every edge, if you want, I'm taking the formal sum of all the triangles containing that edge. Or another way to think about it, if you want to think about it as a, 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 f a, a map on functions, so we have functions, so uh, delta f of some f, where f now is in x i plus 1, is sigma of f of g, where g is inside f, and g is of size i. You can think about it for a second. You see that this is really the same type, the same definition. Just okay. um, so, as you can see, it's, it's everything is very elementary. It needs a little bit of uh, time to digest. I'll, I'll, I'll give you examples in a second that you see that it's something quite familiar if you go to graphs. Uh, but here are, here are uh, uh, exercises. Now, there is no point that I will solve this exercise for you. B one should do it once in a lifetime, no, not more than once. <laughs> but uh, everyone should do it. And, and to check that sigma square is equal to 0. Or to be more precise now, if you take, I should really call this a sigma i. I will always uh, and, and I call this delta delta i, I will always go according to the domain. If it comes from i, I will denote it by i. Um, so sigma uh, i, say, minus, uh, uh, or sigma i after sigma i plus 1 is 0. Usually we just write sigma square equals 0, though it's not a precise uh, notation. And similarly, with the co-boundary, with going up. So this is sigma is boundary. This is a co-boundary, uh, delta i after delta i minus 1 is equal 0. So delta square equals 0. Now, there is actually a okay, corollary for that is that if the note b, now, now, now again, as I said, many notations, b i lower notation always re uh, uh, regard uh, are about chains and homology. We'll see in a minute. Uh, and a boundary. Upper notation <coughs> is always about co-boundary. So the note bi, bi of x, f2, if you want the formal full notations, this is the image of sigma, uh, uh, the notation will always uh, will remind us where we are sitting. So bi will sit inside ci, and it will be the image of sigma i plus 1. Those elements of the in the i dimension, which are boundaries of something in the i plus 1, in the i plus 1 dimension. And the, let zi be the kernel of sigma i, then the corollary of 1 is that bi is inside zi, right? Because if, if uh, applying twice we are getting 0, it means that the image, that the kernel contains the image. And now we are ready to define the homology group hi. This is the homology group of x over f2 is simply this quotient zi over bi. Exactly the same thing with the cohomology. If we take b upper i to be the image of delta i minus 1, you see I, I want it to be a subspace of the i dimensional of the of the not i dimensional of the ci of the i of the i co chain then this is inside z upper i which is the kernel of delta i the one going up and we can define the cohomology this is cohomology to be the space, the quotient space zi over bi. Uh, last two exercises. 
uh, one is that the dimension of HI is equal to the dimension of HI. This is a general fact about homology cohomology over fields. We, one can kill, uh, really identify them. This is, if you think about it, this is, uh, this is uh, more difficult than the previous exercise, but it's still uh, uh, linear algebra first year undergraduate level. You have to think about it for a second, kind of play the game. Uh, another thing which is an exercise, um, well, maybe I'll divide it into two exercises. One is, uh, no, I need more space. Uh, if we define, we can define um, an in, in inner product, or if you want, scalar product on a, on a chain and core chain. If say F is in CI, but you can really think about it also as CI. You see, like sometimes convenient for me to uh, to uh, identify them. Then, and you have another element G here, and you want to, and we defined the s product between them as uh, it, it will be sigma over all f in x i of f of f times g of f, and everything is in the mod two in the mode to arithmetic. Everything is over the finite field of order two. And the exercise for A is that if you take, say, F, if F is in CI and G is in CI minus one, you can do the following. You can compute the boundary of F going downstairs against G. And here I, I in purposely I kind of confuse between chain and co-chains. Okay? I, I think of it as co-chain, as chain is exactly the same thing. And I can I can take the boundary of F. So the boundary of F is something in C I minus one. So I can compute the inner product here. This is the same as F against the co-boundary of G. So in this sense the boundary and the comb boundary are the exactly the dual maps to each other. And the corollary, which is very important, it's, it's, a, it's a minor, it's a, it's a trivial point, but it's going to play a, an important role, I'll give you an int already now, in the quantum error correcting codes that I will talk about later, is, is, the, is the following corollary that I will leave you as an exercise. That if you take bi, which is the what is bi? These are the boundaries, right? The boundaries, and you take the orthogonal. I, I don't want to say orthogonal complement, because things are not necessarily complement to each other. But I can always take the orthogonal with respect to this, to this, uh, uh, how you call it, inner product, scalar product, whatever. Then this is exactly z upper i. And B upper i uh, orthogonal is exactly z lower i, and the opposite. If you take the 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 the, the orthogonal, uh, I know how to say it, not complement, the orthogonal space to this one, you will get this one. Okay. Now these are these are uh, 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 easy exercise using this. Like for example, maybe I just to, just to see that uh, at least. In one direction, uh, if you take, say, take an element, uh, take an element uh, uh, G in BI, and take an element F in Z upper I, and you want to compute, to, to show that they are orthogonal to each other. So G of with F is equal to, now, G is in BI. What does it mean? It means that this is a boundary of something. So this is a boundary of, of some H. Right? So you compute the boundary of H with respect to, uh, with F, by, but by the first part, this is equal to H with the co-boundary of F. 
but F is in the kernel of the co-boundary map. I forgot to say this is called co-boundaries and this is called co-cycle. I forgot to say cycle and co-cycles. These are the, these are cycles and these are co-cycles. And now because this is in the kernel, so delta of F is zero, so uh, uh, H with zero is equal zero. And you see that they're orthogonal and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so basically this is the all, this is the all, we finish the course on all the notations and notions of, uh, of cohomology, but now let's see the relevant to combinatorics. Let's, let's start with some simple things like, like, uh, like with graphs. What is the meaning, what is the meaning of this uh, for graphs? So, uh, again, I don't, I, I'm trying to take kind of the shortest path to what I really want to show. So I will not, let me see, I prepare for myself what I really want to show. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so let's take, for example, uh, let's take examples. So let x be a graph. So we all know what, it, what does it mean. A graph for us is a simplicial complex of dimension one. It has edges, vertices, and also the the empty set as an as as a as a as a as a cell of dimension minus one. Okay. So now uh, let's see uh, let's see what is the cocycle. Z1 or Z0 of the graph. Let's, let's think for a second, what is this? What is this? Or maybe even better, let's understand what is the co-boundary map from C0 to C1, right? We take a function on the vertices. So a function on the vertices in C0 is really the characteristic function of some subset A, right? Where A is a subset of V, right? And we take delta of F. So what is delta of F? Delta of F of E of an edge, how do we compute it, right? We sum up the, we have to look at, by definition, we have to sum up the, a, 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 we, we have to take the walls of E. E is something of dimension one. The walls of E is the two endpoints of it. So this is really F of E plus yeah, co-boundary. Co so you want uh, to take uh, the vertices and to take the I go, oh, oh, no, no, that's okay. No, 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 it's okay. I take the, the co-boundary delta, F is in C0. And I want, and I need to, uh, delta of F will be something in, uh, it's be a function on edges. So now compute, how do I compute it on edges? I compute it on the edge by using F on the vertices. So this is F of E plus, plus F of E minus. Now this is, this is zero or one, right? Now when it is zero, it's zero if, both of them are in A, or both of them are not in A. So it's not zero exactly if the edge is between A and outside A, right? So this is exactly as a set. Now I want to, 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 I want to, you to get used and, and I want to, con uh, uh, um, to confuse you all the time and that's actually a very, uh, um, kind of fruitful confusion to think about them as, as, a, as, a, as function and to think about them as subsets. So if you really think about it as a subset now, you see the delta of F is exactly the set of all edges between A and A bar as a set. Delta of F, the co-boundary, is exactly what usually we call the edge, uh, the edge go going out from uh, from this. Now, and therefore, what is Z0? What is the cycle? 
So let's think, the cost cycle is all the map, it's all the functions uh, whose co-boundary is zero. Now we understand what, what, what does it mean. It's all the sets whose, with no edges, going outside. Right? Which type of sets like that you have in a graph? The connected component or union of connected components, right? So it's exactly, so Z node is exactly all function F, so that F is, if you want, F is constant on a connected component, namely, uh, or if you want, is a formal sum of connected components. In particular, now, okay, so, uh, sorry, just a second. Now, let's see, what is B0? They want to compute the, the zero homology of the graph. It's the zero cohomology of the graph. What is B0? B0 is, you have a map. Okay, B0 is the image of the map delta from C minus one to C0. Now, what is C minus one? <laughs> the the, the functions on the empty set. The empty set is an element of C minus 1, and we have functions from this set to 0, 1. Well, you can guess, there are only two fun functions, right? Either the 0 function or the function which take the empty set, which is an element, to 1. And if you check, you see, uh, 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 formally, that what you get, that B0 contains two functions on the edges, the, the zero function and the function which is one on V, the constant function on all the vertices. You think about the vertices as subsets of size one. Each one of them contains the empty set, and therefore, if you compute. Well, and so this is of dimension one. The dimension of this is the number of connected components. So the dimension of H0 is equal to the, the, the number of connected components minus 1. Let me give you a nice exercise for Ohm. Prove directly. This needs a little thinker directly that the dimension of h little zero of the homology is the same thing. We know that it must be the same thing, but somehow that this is the same. But uh, like find the kind of the right interpretation of h uh, zero. What is important, we, and we are going to use after that uh, very soon. Is, is the following that and that a corollary X is a connected graph if and only if the first cohomology group vanish. Right? So we have a cohomological, or homological, I prefer cohomological expression to the fact that a graph is, is connected. Okay, you can play a little bit with this, but I want to go ahead with a more kind of substantial uh, application. Let's see if I wanted to say something more as a preparation. Uh, no, I think we are ready to, g to get something, the first sort of uh, non-trivial uh, notion in this lecture. And this is I-dimensional expander or I-dimensional expansion. I will, uh, there are two s essentially equivalent uh, definitions. I, 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 first of all, I'll define it in something which is uh, slightly more intuitive. I mean, to be honest, it's completely not intuitive. But it's, it's slightly better than the next one, which will be even less intuitive. But uh, 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 the next one will be just some kind of a normalization of, of this one. So let's start with something which we can still see. So definition, if x is a simplicial complex, 
uh, and uh, of dimension d. And i will be something between 0 and d minus 1. We define epsilon i tilde. Later on, I will draw the tilde, and I will ta a epsilon i. This will be the i expansion of x. So for every dimension, we'll get an expansion of the simplicial complex. And it will be defined in the following way. We take the infimum, well, it's really finite, so it's the minimum of the following objects. Uh, the minimum over all function f, which are in ci, but not in bi. I'm taking all the functions, all the cochains, which are in the space of cotton, but are not in the space of co-boundary. And I, and I take the delta of f, the co-boundary of f, and its norm, or its norm really means its size, maybe, let's say the size of it, um, divided by the norm or the size of its, well, here I must write, maybe I'll write a norm now, because, but later on I will change the definition of the norm. So this will be like norm with tilde. <laughs> I will normalize it after that. It will be m better somehow. But I uh, divided by the norm of the coset of f, where the coset of f means f plus bi. You see, I'm taking functions in the space of cochain, and I add to them the space of co-boundaries. So I'm getting a coset of this subspace. I, uh, I take the, the coset, and the norm of the coset means, the norm of the coset means the minimum of the norm of G over every G in the coset. Now, if you think about it, this is actually something which is, if you think for a second, you see that something which we, we can understand, what does it mean? Because this is really, everything is over F2. Now, what, what does it mean to be the minimum in the coset? If G is minimum in the coset in F plus B, I, then if you think about it, you see that the, the distance, the norm of G is exactly the amming distance between F and Bi. Because, you see, you replace F by another representative, right? Which, is, which has a minimum norm. And this really means that F minus G is inside B. And this is the minimal with this. And this is exactly the distance between F and Bi. Now, this is a trivial point. You have to think about it. But in a way, what makes all the subject that I'm going to talk with you difficult is exactly this little point. Let me make maybe give an int now, if I forget to say it. Over the real numbers, to compute the distance from a vector to a subset, to a subspace is an, it's a really first year undergraduate exercise, right? Uh, what is called this algorithm? Uh, we teach it in linear algebra. You know, you, you make auto autonormal, you take projection. Uh, what? Gram, uh, Gram, Gram Schmidt algorithm. <laughs> You, it's a projection, right? You take the projection to space, and then the distance from you to, and, and that's we know there is an algorithm to do it. To compute the distance between a general vector and a general subspace is NP complete problem, and kind of in this, in this script, in, in over F2. And this, some of our problems are going to be difficult exactly because this little point. That if we would do it over R, it will be much easier. So keep this kind of message relevant. So here, what we are doing, we are taking the norm of delta f, and we divide it by the distance of f from bi, which is positive number because we chose f to be outside bi. That's the reason we must take f to be. Otherwise, it would not be well defined. Okay, And this is what we call expansion.
Why? If we're working over the reels, what? If we're working combinatorially and over the reels, um, this would be like the smallest harmonic representative of, of a, absolutely of, a, of, of cycle. Yeah. Right. If it's cycle, right. Or, or, or if it's coach, and it will be like the right, right, right. Right. Oh, you can even uh, see you can even see a spectral gap if you want of the of the Laplacian. But let but let me not uh, jump to that. Um, let me just show you. Okay, uh, we we have to to continue our journey and to see the meaning of these objects for graph, right? So let's see what does it mean for graph. You know, it looks very unintuitive. Uh, you should be convinced that there is something natural here. Because it came, essentially the same, the same definition came independently in the work of uh, Lineal Meshulam studying random simplicial complexes and in the work of Gromov studying uh, uh, topological ov uh, overlapping. So I, I, will, I will say something about both, but the fact that you know, people came from completely different uh, uh, direction and came to the same type of definition somehow suggests that that's something natural. And in fact, something that's the most important definition in my talk today. I will show you the connection with this definition with property testing, with locally testable code, and something like that. So, so I know that it's <laughs> not so intuitive, but, uh, but let me convince you that that's the right thing to do. So let's go back to the graph. Let now x now a graph. And let's see what is this epsilon zero, right? So we have to pick up i between zero and d minus one. There is only one option here, like i equals zero. And let's see what is a, a epsilon that. This is what? So this is by definition the minimum over all functions f in c zero minus b zero. Let's remind ourselves. So c zero is all characteristic functions, right, on the vertices. What is B0? B0 are there. It's still here. Are, 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 uh, you, you, you have to single out two subsets. The empty set, uh, 0, which is the empty set, and the full set. So this is exactly all, so this is now Let's translate it. This is all subset A of V, but not V and not the empty set. Right? Now, what is delta of F? Delta of F, we computed. Delta of F, we said before, this is exactly the set of all edges going from A outside. This is the set. So this is delta of f divided by the norm of the coset of f. Okay. So now let's translate this to a simple Hebrew. Oh. Uh, what is delta of f? Delta of f is e a a bar. The size of, 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 the, of the sets going out divided by the distance between F and BI. What is the distance between F? F is a characteristic function of a set A, which is neither empty nor everything. What is the distance between it and the empty set and the total set? It's exactly the minimum between the size of A and the size of A complement, right? If A is less than half, then this is A, because then it's closer to the empty set. If, if A is, is more than half, this is the size of A. Right? And we got exactly the Chigger constant of a graph, the standard definition of expansion. So at least you see that this type of strange uh, definition is a direct generalization of the, of the Chigger constant. OK. What else we want to say? 
Now, another, uh, uh, so now I can put things together and I can explain to you why lineal Meshulam. So now I can start, I think, to describe the various connections with various topics in combinatorics and, okay, uh, in computer science, maybe I'll do it first and then I will norm, it will be convenient somehow to normalize this type of uh, 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 constant. Uh, but okay, but let's first, uh, uh, is a, here, is a, here is an easy observation that this epsilon i tilde of x is a positive number. This is number, this is a minimum of, over some rational numbers. If and only if hi, the cohomology group, vanish. Why? You see? Let's assume that the cohomology does not vanish. What does it mean that it does not vanish? That there exists a function in zi, in the, which is a cos cycle in the kernel of delta, which is not in bi. So there exists a function in this set, not in bi, such that delta of f is 0. So, the, so delta of f is zero, so and, and you divide it by a non-zero number, and then, and then you get that epsilon i is zero. But also vice versa. These are, there are only finitely many vectors here, it's a f functions. In, if, uh, in, if none of them is, is zero, then the minimum is not zero. And therefore, you don't have any function in zi, which, uh, which is, right? So this is, this is a trivial statement. Now, this trivial statement came up in the work of Liniel Meshulam. Nati Niliel Roy Meshulam set up a program to generalize the classical Erdos Reni uh, theory of, uh, of random graphs. Now, the theory of, uh, of Erdos Reni is, is uh, saying the following, you take n points and you, def and, you, and you pick up and you decide, now I'm talking to the very pure mathematicians because now I'm, uh, <laughs> my problem in this talk that in every single subject I will talk there are people in the audience who knows it's so better than me, so I have to be careful all the time. Uh, so the lineal, the, the, the Erdos Reni, um, the, the Erdos Reni model, <laughs> sorry, the Erdos Reni model is that you take the, you take n points and you, for every pair, you decide, you, p, you by, by, by probability p, if the edge is inside or outside, this gives you a random, a, a model from random graph, and you study its property. The first, first property that Erdos and Reni study was what's the probability or, uh, 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 when this graph is going to be connected. And they prove a beautiful result, kind of a threshold. If p is less than log n over n, then the graph is not going to be connected. If its p is more than log n over n, the, the graph will be connected. Now, Linear Meshulam took a, a, they, they started only in dimension two, but they, well, maybe they find the model in general, but really did the work. They said, oh, let's talk about dimension two. They say, I'm taking, I want a model of a random work, um, of a random simplicial complex. A random simplicial complex will be for me the following thing. I'm taking the one skeleton, the complete one skeleton. We take the complete graph. And so all the edges are inside. And then we decide about every triangle, about every triple of i, j, k. I, I decide with probability p. Are they, is this triangle inside the collection or outside the collection? So I'm getting a random uh, uh, simplicial complex. Now, we have to be a bit careful here because about random graphs, if any two of I will go will to separate room and we'll have to invent random models, they probably will come up with the Erdos Reni. Here, 
if somebody will give you, invent a model of a random simplicial complex, you know, you can come with uh, maybe other suggestions. But this is the linear Meshulam model, that you take the complete D minus one skeleton, namely you take all subsets of size D, all subsets of size D, namely of dimension D minus one, and then you decide for subset of size d plus 1, you decide by probability p, are they in or out? Now, the first question they want to study is whether this is connected, right? Like Erdos Reni. But of course it's connected. Because if you take the full, if you take the full, let's think about dimension 2. If you take the full uh, one skeleton, then it's connected, right? I mean, it's a full graph. It's a complete graph. So they said, we will not study connectivity. We'll study, and, and that's the right notion from the perspective of uh, uh, algebraic topology. Topology, algebraic topology. Uh, uh, and, and, and the vanishing of the cohomology, because you remember we have x is a connected graph, if and only if h0, h0 equal 0. So they said, for dimension 1, you want the vanishing of H0. In dimension D, you want the vanishing of H, D minus 1. It's easy to see that in their context, the old cohomology up to D minus 1 certainly vanish once you take the, the full skeleton, one, one, once you took all, all of them. And so the, 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 the game now is, when this cohomology will vanish. If we will take all the, the triangles, then it will vanish. That's another something not difficult. The question is, when it's going to vanish? And they prove the following beautiful results. In fact, I will give you, they prove it in dimension two and then Meshulam and his student Volach prove it in the general case, dimension T. They found that threshold, threshold for vanishing of H D minus one of X in, I, I want to stress, in the lineal Meshula model, right? I mean, like the model is part of the, of the game here, is at, d times log n divided by n. You remember for graphs we have log n divided by n, for two dimensional twice log n, for d dimensional d times log n over n. So that's very beautiful. You, you know, if you take probability less than that, the cohomology does not vanish. Probability more than that, it vanish. Now, the interesting thing that they invent, there was a question? Uh, yeah, I think they know. I don't remember, but yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the kind of result that after you say it, it's not so difficult to prove. Right, so how, how small do you want it to be? It would, so in the graph case, it would be, a, uh, it would be like a power before, mm -hmm. the number of connected components. Yeah, here, here you have to write. Uh, okay, I, I don't know. I mean, didn't get that far to that. I mean, maybe, I'm sure now, there are people that. The interesting thing is, they invented this notion in order to study the vanishing. They even don't call it expansion. They just take this invariant. And basically, for them, the crucial thing was that this is a positive, if and only if this is vanished. And in fact, if you think about it, what they prove, and if you go backward to Erdos Reni, you see that what they prove, Erdos and Reni really prove that up to the threshold, it's not connected. Above the threshold, not only that this is, that the graph is connected, but it's even expander. And they also got it here. If we now, you can guess that we are going to call a simplicial complex an expander, or a, or a family of simplicial complexes we will call the epsilon expanders, if this epsilon z tilde, all of them, all epsilon i, at all level, are at least some epsilon. You right? Put a on, on what? I mean, in this model, you have a lot of edges. 
Right, okay, good. Yeah, that's exactly, you are right, and that's exactly I have to make the definition even more ugly. And I have to normalize it. It's like for graphs, you know, and, and here is, in, in application, it's maybe even, even more uh, important. In graph, you know, usually we say that the graph is an expander if we have this property, right? But usually we really mean if it's a kind of a k regular and k is fixed. Now, if k is not going to infinity, then we don't want to call expander that something which grows just a little bit if the, if the degrees are, are going to infinity, right? So we can normalize, and uh, you know, various people are doing various uh, things about that. But uh, here, so it's very natural, so, so that's exactly what I promised you to make things even more ugly, and uh, to define a, but I think after you saw it and may hopefully convinced that this is a good notion, you, you will be willing to accept a slight modification of it, and which seems to be the right thing to do. I mean, in, 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 you'll see in a minute, in the, in the lineal Meshulam work, it was not crucial, and indeed they didn't do it. In the work of uh, Gromov, it's more important, not that Gromov did it, because he doesn't care about details. <laughs> but it was clear that that's what he meant somehow. <laughs> what? Absolutely, absolutely. No, F2 is crucial in his work. Yeah, that's... And that's, that's uh, that I'll, I'll give you his main results kind of in a second. I'll come to that. Um, but, but it does not really <laughs> formulate. <laughs> you know, it's a Gromov style of writing. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so a definition now, we'll, we'll do the following. Uh, so again, x, simplicial complex. And we'll call, a, I will assume from now on, uh, a pure simplicial complex, a, a, a pure d-dimensional simplicial complex, which mean pure means means that all maximal uh, faces are of dimension d. Now. Uh, for the computer scientist, that's actually the most natural object because this is exactly the same as what it is called uniform hypertrees, a uh, hypergraphs. Because hypergraph is usually a collection of subsets, and you don't assume that it's closed under inclusion. But the most interesting one is the so-called uniform hypergraph. You take set of S of or, uh, uh, some set of a uh, collection of subset of all of them of the same size. If all of them of the same size, uh, you start with such a uniform hypergraph, you can close it under inclusion, just add formally all their subset, and you get a pure simplicial complex. If you start with a pure simplicial complex, you can take the maximal cells and you get a uniform hypergraph. So uniform hypergraph and, and pure simplicial complex are exactly the same thing. They are uh, good to distinguish between mathematician and computer scientists <laughs> because if somebody talks about simplicial complex, his background is mathematics. Somebody talks about e hypergraph, his background is computer science, but except of that, there is really no difference. So this is really, uh, in fact, I will show you in the work of Gromov, it's natural to talk in, in hypergraph, another simplicial complex, and it's so interesting that you really have, for the proofs you have, the, the, the property, the theorem he proves, is really about hypergraph. But somehow you have to go to the lower dimensional, you have to fill it in, and, and you come to this notion of a, a, on I expansion at all levels in order to prove the results on the top hypergraph. Okay, but that's kind of a side remark. Uh, let's continue, and then we will define epsilon, uh, so maybe let's define first. We have d-dimensional pure d simplest. For every face f in x, let's define the weight of f. Uh, so we have to normalize things properly. I, uh, this will be, the weight of f will be the number of g in x d, we look at the top dimension. We look at the number of cells in the top dimension. I sometimes uh, they are called facets or chambers. 
the number of chambers containing F, you divide it by the total number of d-dimensional faces. And it's, I think, a question of uh, if uh, f is, say, in xi. And then I think it's good to, I hope I uh, write it correctly here, maybe the, this normal is. And, and you have to add some constant here. The reason, uh, OK, that's. It's kind of the proportion of the number of faces, the, 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 the number of facets containing you, and you kind of normalize it. And then we define the norm of f, of a vector f, for f in, in ci to be simply the sum over all f in f. You know, we can think of a function, and a, uh, uh, as usual, we can think of as a function, as a core chain, as a function on the i-dimensional cells. So we can think of it as a set of i cells. So I can, I can, uh, I define the norm of f as the sum of the weights of f over all f in f, and the same with the distance. You know, the same as before. So now we define epsilon i to be the minimum over all f in ci minus bi of the norm of delta f, the norm of the co-boundary of f, divided by the norm of f. But this time, this is with the right definition of norm. And it's better to, to, to take this as, as your expansion. Um, and what you see which kind of helpful is that if f is the function of all xi, you know, the, the if you take all the, the characteristic function of the one on all, if you take all the, all the cells, then the norm of f is exactly one. This is the goal of this normalization. And so you can think of it as this W as a kind of a probability measure on the space of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of I cells. And it's kind of convenient. X I not on the X1. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Xi. Then the norm is 1. And so you can think of it as a kind of a probability measure if you want. You know, it's a finer thing, but uh, on that. OK. So I think we are ready to prove our first theorem. And it will be the only theorem that we will prove today. But I want to somehow to show you how to work with this notion. And then I will make some use of this theorem. I, and I, I will just prove a special case of it. This was proved uh, in. Uh, basically by Linial Meshulam in their work and by Gromov. You know, if it's uh, uh, Linial Meshulam prove it, and Gromov said it is clear. <laughs> and it's not so clear. <laughs> uh, so here is the theorem. Uh, let, let x B, what I prefer to call the complete d dimensional simplicial complex on n vertices. So simply x is the set f inside n of all, all, the, all the subset of size at most d plus 1, right? These are the set. All of them, you take all the subsets. This is the simplicial complex. You take all sets of size at most d plus 1. Then for every i between 0 and d minus 1, epsilon i is, slight, is uh, essentially 1, is 1. Uh, maybe plus a uh, little o of n. I think it's. I, I think it's really strictly bigger than one, but maybe it might be a little small. But it's essentially one. 
I will, I will prove it only proof for d equal 2. I'll take the first non-trivial case. So this whole thing, you mean something that tends to 0 with n Yeah, with n tends to infinity. Okay. It's not the usual conventional low one No, it's why? Low little one. o, what? It's low of 1. Ah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> little o is a function of n one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Now you see that I'm not even a mathematician, but an algebraist. I don't Very <laughs> uh, okay, so let's, uh, I will just prove it for d equal 2, and, and I will just prove it for i, i equal 1. Because for i equal 0, for, uh, for i equal 0, this is the Chigger constant, right? The, the, for i equal 0, I mean, I showed it to you for graph, but the if you take a d-dimensional space, a d-dimensional simplicial complex, and you compute the expansion at level 0, then uh, uh, only the first, the, the one skeleton of the simplicial complex plays a role. So it's like computing it for a graph. So it's just the Chigger constant. And you believe me that the Chigger constant of such a complete graph is 1. Well, it's 1 because of the normalization. Of course, it's more than 1. But because we normalize, that's exactly what we want. We want it to be. Then it's one, and and let me do it. Uh, let me do it now for uh, for for r equal one. So what 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 do we have to prove? So let's so let's take let I, I will call it alpha. You can call it f if you want, but uh, b in c one of x f two. So this is if you want. This is a function on the edges of the two dimensional uh, complete. Simplicial complex. Let alpha be in C1. So alpha is a collection, is really a set of edges. Uh, now, for an edge E in X1 and the vertex u in x0 such that u is not in e, is not on the edge, denote uh, ue or eu the, simply the unique triangle containing both. Right, there is one triangle which contains this E and this U. And now we are in the complete two-dimensional uh, complex, so it's really inside. It's really inside X. Now, a, a given such an alpha, define alpha U. A given alpha, and let's say that U is inside uh, is a vertex in x0. We define alpha u. To those who are familiar a little with the language, we are really, we are really uh, taking a code chain, a global code chain, and we restrict it to the link of the vertex. But uh, or, uh, another way to think about it is to think in al alpha, alpha 0. OK, so the formal way to think about it as an element in in C0, you see, we start with alpha in C1. We will think of it as an element in C0 of XF2. So we will we look at uh, uh, the best thing to think about is like alpha U is the local view of alpha from the point U. So what is it? Alpha U of some vertex V will be 1 if the, uh, if the vertex, if the edge uv is in alpha. See, if the edge pointing out from u toward v is part of our alpha, I will take it 
to be. And zero otherwise, in particular, it is zero also alpha u of u is also zero. It's basically the, se the set of neighbors which are connected to you by elements of alpha. If you think of alpha as graph. If you think of alpha as graph, this is a set of neighbors of, uh, of you, exactly. OK. And now, here is uh, a simple uh, identity that can be checked easily. Alpha minus delta z zero. You know, now I can look at alpha u. Alpha u is an element in C0, is a function on vertices. I can look at its co-boundary. And the claim is, and then I can, I can, um, so now alpha u is a function of vertices. Delta of alpha u is a function on edges. Alpha is a function on edges. So I can subtract them. So alpha of this is equal to the same thing as delta 1 of alpha. What is delta 1 of alpha? Delta 1 of alpha is a function on triangles, right? So delta 1 of alpha is a function of triangles, and, and we will compute it on the triangle UE. And 0, so this is if U is not in E, and then this has a meaning. If U is in E, so this should be, sorry, this should be alpha minus delta 0 of alpha u computed on an edge E, you will take the triangle between uh, u and E, you compute delta 1 of alpha on it, and you get this unless, uh, uh, and it's 0, I mean this also can be 0 in many cases, but anyway it will be 0 if u is in E, if e con like it's a function of E, so if E contains u. Let me, let me just leave you to check this. I mean, this is just, just, just to play the little uh, game and check, and check that this is the case. This is just the, uh, uh, and now, and now we, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can compute. So let's compute what is three times Delta, what I'm going to do, I'm going to count things and with, without normalizing. And later on, we will normalize. Let's compute what is de three times delta 1 of alpha, right? That's what we want to compute, right? We have, we have to start with some alpha in C1. We have to take alpha, which is in eventually alpha, which is in C1, but not in B1, to look at its co-boundary. Right, to compute the norm of its co-boundary and to compare it to the distance of alpha to the bound to the co-boundaries in, in CI. Okay, I haven't lost you, I hope. I yeah. In general, it's incomplete. I compare x1 and x2 until they are the same after the whole Right, right. It's, it's just now because, right, it's, it's, it's right, that's why it's, here it's more, con it's more convenient really to count our magic and, and at, uh, we will normalize only at the very end. So let's compute the size. So I, I don't put norm, I put just the size of it. OK, the size, so delta 1 of alpha is a set of triangles, right? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm counting these triangles. So this is equal, I claim. By definition, you'll see in a minute, it's equal to the pairs of all u and t, where t is a triangle such that uh, this is inside x0 cross x2, such that u is in t, and t is in delta 1 of alpha. Right? This is nothing like I, I take the set of all triangles t, which are in delta 1 of alpha, 
and I count each one of them three times, right? Because I, I take pairs, u and t, where u is in t, is, an ed, is, is a vertex on t, and t is in delta 1 of alpha. So this is a trivial equality. But now, this is equal, I claim, to the set of all ue in x0 cross x1, such that, let now we have to think a minute, e is inside alpha minus delta 0 of alpha u. Alpha minus delta 0 of alpha u is a one cochain. A one cochain is a set of edges. I can think of it as a set of edges. And I claim that this is equal. Why? This is because of this uh, star. OK, let's think about that. The star told us that what does it mean delta 1 of alpha of, of some triangle UE? Right? If I, I look at the triangle with a point U on it. Then E is the, is the, the wall against the wall against you, right? So, uh, so I can present my triangle T now. I, I start with a triangle T here with a point on U on it. So I can think of T as U with some E, right? And e is uniquely determined. Now this, so this T equal UE is equal to alpha minus delta 0 alpha U of this E. So I'm getting that this is now like having all u and e such that e is here, right? And if you want, u is not in e. Anyway, it would not be in e. Otherwise, it would be the 0 on that side. It doesn't matter, really. OK? So now <coughs> I claim, so now what, what happens here? So here, we are going over sigma. Now I can say I go over all u and all e. So I can say this is like going over all u in v, in x0, and computing the, no, the, the size of alpha minus delta 0 alpha u. Right? Because this is the size of this set. Like for every pair u and e, I'm uh, for every u, I'm taking all the edges which are inside this set. So this is like the size of this set is exactly the size of this set. But this is, now what I'm doing here, now think about it. I'm taking now alpha. And I subtract from it, or add to it, you know, it's mod 2, something which is in the co-boundaries by definition. You see, this is a co-boundary, because it delta 0 of something which coming from the vertices. So this number is at least, the norm of this number, this, so this number is another element in the coset of alpha, right? So this is at least the, the distance, the, the number of ones here, is, a, it is at least the distance between alpha and the boundary. And I'm going over all the vertices. So this is n times the distance between alpha and b and b1. So what do we get all together? We got the delta 1 of alpha. The size of it is at least n over 3 of the distance of alpha b1. And now if you normalize, just think about that, that the number of, uh, if you normalize, um, here you have to normalize like you normalize triangles, which is kind of dividing by, uh, by a, d plus 1 over uh, 2. Anyway, if you normalize, uh, 
Okay, so uh, the crucial thing is that x2 over x1 is approximately n over 3, and therefore, if you normalize correctly, this becomes to be 1. And you get what we, what we wanted to prove. I, uh, so let, let, let me recall what is a property testing and uh, locally testable codes very quickly. So property testing is if we have, I'll take the spatial case that we, we really care, like we have some subset Pn of, of, a, uh, of the vector space F2 to the n, and uh, we say that Pn is, I don't know, Q epsilon locally testable, or testable, testable, if there exists a random algorithm which take which looks at only q bits of alpha in f 2 to the n and now the, the point is that q independent of n, that's, that's the, this is the important property, Ans and answers always yes if alpha is inside pn. So th this, this algorithm wants to decide if alpha is inside the set or not, and no, and reject it, and no, with probability, if it's not, uh, with probability at least epsilon, the distance, the, the, the normalized distance, right? You take the normalized amming distance between alpha and pn. Namely, if alpha is, is, uh, is not in pn, okay, we cannot expect it to always to be correct if it just little bit different than being in, in Pn, uh, but uh, if the distance, the normalized distance is at, is at least something, then it will be, it will detect it with a probability at least the distance time, a time uh, epsilon, and again epsilon independent of n. So the most famous example, I think, which if I know, uh, started all this area was the question you take the set of all functions from f2 to the n to f2. So this is a vector space of dimension 2 to the n. Uh, and you ask, is, uh, and given a function, is it linear or not? Is it a linear function? So the test is you pick up uh, two vectors, x and y, and you check whether f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y. If it's linear, of course, the answer will be yes. If it's not linear, then the, the results say that it's at least, uh, I think, 2, 9 or something like that, the distance of the function from the linear function. This started all this area. The most kind of, uh, so this is the PCP, et cetera. I'm afraid there are too many experts here that I'm afraid to say more. But the most uh, kind of uh, down-to-earth examples and which people, uh, which are also important in the general theory of PCP, but, but, but it has kind of practical uh, importance by itself, is the so-called locally testable code. So these are error-correcting codes. So what is an error-correcting code? For us, an error-correcting code is just a, it's just a sub, let's say a linear error-correcting code, it's just a linear subspace of F2 to the N. And now, which represent the, the true, correct uh, 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 words that one can submit. The receiver is getting some vector alpha, very large, n is very large, 200,000, and he, he wants to look only on 50 bits and to decide very quickly whether this vector is uh, correct, or at least if it's not too corrupted. Because if it's, if it's close enough to, to be true, it will apply some error correcting code. But if it's completely corrupted, there is no point to apply it. So I guess, fair enough explanation. 
and then look at decimal code. Now, the big problem in this case is to get, now a, a code is called a good code if there are two, for codes, there are two uh, uh, like kind of religiously people denotes code with three variables, uh, n, k, and d. So n is the dimension of this, so a code for us is just a subspace of f2 to the n. So this is the n. k is the dimension of the code as a vector space. And d is the distance of the code, which because it's a, it's a, it's a subspace, we can think of it as the smallest uh, arming weight, the weight of alpha, the arming weight of alpha where alpha is some non-trivial element in the code and maybe better to think about it as the minimum distance between two vectors in the code in the arming distance. What? Uh, yes, it is the minimum over all alpha. Yeah. And the, a, a code is called good if k and d grows linearly with n. When we say code, we always mean, an, we are not engineers, we are mathematicians. So we always mean an infinite family of codes when n is going to infinity. And if k and d both goes to uh, uh, linearly with n, then this is called a good code, or if you want a, a good family of codes. Now, an, a, a code will be locally testable if there exists some epsilon and q and, an, and, an, and a random algorithm that will enable us to choose, that, that will enable us to look at only fixed number of bits, q bits, and decide if alpha is in the code with probability, uh, 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 and will reject it with probability at least epsilon times the, the distance from this alpha to the code world. Now, the, the one thing I want to point out that whenever you have an expander, you have its built in, or I dimensional expander built in, you have a solution for a property testing. You have a result. If you can prove that some simple initial complex is, is, a, is a, a, a expander, so I forgot to say, but of course, we call simplicial complex epsilon expander if all the epsilon i are greater or equal epsilon for every i between 0 to d minus 1. And if you have such a family of expanders, then automatically you have locally testable codes. Now, I'm not claiming that they are so good. Right, in, in, in any, uh, right, so in any eye, right. So, so, so let's, let, this is just a reformulation of the story. Let's, let's go and see that this is exactly the same thing. So let's call it, uh, if you want to be, the co-cycle test. So, and I'll show you what's the code and what's the test. So we'll take the code C to be the co-boundaries BI, so, okay, the word C is maybe used too much here, so I'll do it like C like that. This, think of it as a subspace of the code chain CI. So this is a subspace, so by definition, this is a code. Let's ignore for a minute the, the, the issue of its, of, of its dimension, of its distance, but I want to show you that if x is an epsilon expander, then bi is an epsilon prime locally testable. So there is a, a q such that blah, 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 q and epsilon such that we reject. So what does it mean? I'm taking alpha now, which is in ci, and I want to check, is it a co-boundary or not? Is it a co-boundary co or not, right? So a subspace, we want to check, are you inside? Now, that's not so easy to check if you are co-boundary, because to be a co-boundary, you are even just something, are, 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 you, 
I would describe it by looking at only bounded number. I am allowed to look only on a bounded number of bits of this. Now, this, what are the bits? Alpha, so remember, alpha is a function from xi to f2, right? And I have to decide if alpha is inside bi. The test will be the following. Pick f in x i plus 1 at random. OK. Pick it at random and check if delta f of alpha of f, of capital F, is 0 or not. So if it's 0, answer yes. If it's, if it's, one, if it's not 0, if it's 1, Answer no. This is, the, this is the test. This is the check. So I'm taking I, I'm taking a i plus 1 cell, and I compute this. Now let's, let's see. I compute it to compute delta, delta, oh sorry, not f, alpha. To compute delta of this alpha on f, I need to compute al alpha. I need to look at alpha only on the walls of f. The number of walls, I take a subset of size i plus 1. The number of, of, uh, of walls is exactly i plus 1. i plus 1 is a fixed number independent of the size of the, of the complex. If it is a co-boundary, then in particular it is a co-cycle. Namely, delta alpha must vanish on every cell, right? It must vanish on every cell, and therefore I will get zero. So if it's a co-boundary, 100%, I will be correct. Now, if it's not a co-boundary, if it's not a co-boundary, think about it. What does it mean? It means that it has some distance from being a co-boundary, right? Now, I have an epsilon expander. The, the eps there is an expansion to the function delta, which tell you that exactly that. You remember, I, I know this epsilon i is exactly delta 1 of alpha. I'm, I'm ignoring for a minute the normalization. Divided by the distance of alpha and bi, right? That's exactly what is needed here that if the distance of alpha to the bi is fairly large, you know, it's like 10%, then delta 1 of alpha is also 10%, and then I'm quite likely to pick up f that will detect it. Maybe not by doing it one time, but if I do it sufficiently many times, I will detect it. But a bounded number of time, I will detect it. So if you really follow the definition, this is exactly to say that this is a, 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 an expander is exactly to say it's completely synonyms to say that the co-boundaries are locally testable within the core the co chain. Now, I, I have to admit that I work on expander for, I don't know, 35 years almost, and you, I'm sure you also know. Have you ever seen the following definition of expander graph? So if you, if you, now let, let, me, let, me, let me specialize to the case of graphs and see we are getting a new definition for expander graph using property testing. But basically, of course, once I show you, say, oh, of course, but I, I think it's never been uh, put like that. So look at the case, it's a special case of x expander graphs, and i equals 0. And now, what is the test? We take alpha in C0 minus B0. So C0 is all function on vertices. And B0, you remember what is B0? It's just the constant function, 0 or 1. So here is the, here is the question. Given a function on the vertices, a function f, call it, is f constant? OK, and, and, and here is the test. What is the test? Just a special case of this. Take 
the function, take its co-boundary. Its co-boundary is the function on the edges. What do you compute? You pick up a random edge from the graph, and you check if the two values are equal or not. If they are equal, you answer yes, it's a constant function. If they are not, you answer no. And the claim is that if this is an expander, that, and then the claim is that, so OK, this is the test. Now I'm rushing because I have more, more stories to tell you. But this is a good exercise to, to digest the material here. That, that the graph x is epsilon expander if and only if this test is two epsilon uh, uh, by two queries. You check if a, a two queries test to check if a function is constant. Now, after we say that, we are not surprised by these results because we understand that expander is kind of a mimicking of a randomness. And if you want to check if a function on a set is random, on a function on a set of n vertices in random, the kind of test you will do is to pick up two elements and to check whether it, if it's constant, you, if it's constant, sorry, to check if it's there equal to each other. The expansion is the usual, uh, how you call it, uh, de-randomization, de right? That you pick an edge of the expander graph and you make this check on that edge. And this is kind of a formal way to say that. So this is a new definition of expander using properties testing. So the whole area of expanders is just a little sub-area of property testing. Code here has two words. Okay. Two words. What? You want yeah, the code words. is a, is 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 a terrible code. Of course, it has only two elements. You have to create topology. You have to create topology. Just a second. Just a second. No, no. Okay. Just a second. Now, I mean, uh, so so what I told you all the time. Now let's go back to that. Unfortunately, this is as a code is a very bad code. The bi. Why? It's always a bad code. I mean, there are many cases that the dimension of the code is actually excellent but if the, because the co-boundaries, in the case of graph, the co-boundaries is only the constant function, dimension one, then it's poor. Usually the problem is with the distance, or always the problem with the distance, except of this case. This case is a little bit uh, the opposite. Why? Because you see, if, if the code here is this bi, bi are the co-boundaries. So these are the image of delta from ci minus 1 to ci. If I will take one cell at, at ci minus 1, and I will take, uh, and the co-boundary of it is all the cells containing it. Now this is usually a very small number, and it's always a uh, much smaller sum of the, the dimension of the set of all sets. If it's a bounded degree, it's really extremely bad because it means that I have, in my code, I have, I have uh, vectors which have a bounded support. But even if you take the complete uh, skeleton, like the complete uh, simplicial complex, which we just proved that it is good expander, right? The, the previous results to say that epsilon is, is one, said that these are excellent expanders. So, but, but there, the, the distance will be like square root of the, of the total size, not, not linear in the total size, right? So you want ratios, so you're aiming good means Right. So the big open problem in this subject is find locally testable codes which are good that you can, uh, and this I, this is not known even by, ron by random consideration. Can you find codes which have linear rate, linear distance, and with a, a, a constant number of queries? And uh, this is a kind of the, probably the biggest open problem in this area. And I think people sometimes are willing to compensate, you know, to give up on one of the three. OK, I have to. Uh, uh, I have to go to the other subject. I have two more subjects, so uh, <laughs> in the 15 minutes. So I tell you just the stories. The, the, the fascinating thing of Gromov, uh, it's not connected to computer science, but let me say it, and then I will spend the last few minutes on quantum error correcting codes. But, but, uh, ah, there is something. You do have examples which are quite reasonable. What, what? You have a tally example. No, no, we have, we have a cute application. Uh, OK. Uh, no, no, no. No, 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 this will with, with, with uh, Larry Good and this quantum. I'll come to that. And that's slightly different. But 
That's not expansion. But let, let me show you a cute application that uh, the the still works on me. Yeah. What's the number of queries that you made from this process? In the cost cycle, I plus one. Because you see, the num if you take, an, you take F, which is the dimension of I plus one, and you check alpha on the walls of F, the walls of F are obtained by deleting one point at a time. So the number of walls is i plus 1. So this is like an i plus 1, which is a constant number, and then going to infinity of queries. Let me show you a cute application of this, which is the following property testing problem. Uh, here is an application. I will leave you this as an exercise. Uh, uh, if, you have, if you have a vector beta, say, which is uh, plus or minus 1, We can define the matrix beta tensor beta. This is like of size n, or m, say, which is an m by m function such that in the b, such that b i j is equal to beta i beta j. OK? So this function, this matrix, is necessarily symmetric. And it has one on the diagonal, right? Here is the property testing problem. Given a matrix, given a matrix D, a D with M by M plus minus one, one on the diagonal and, um, and symmetric, is uh, D is beta tensor beta for some beta, like that. And I want to decide on that problem by looking only at a bounded number of bits out of this matrix. Then, then uh, here is an answer. Here is a test. Here, here is a good test, which, which do it for you. <coughs> Uh, the test is pick random i, j, k different than each other and look at b, i, j times b, j, k times b, k, i, whether this is equal to 1 or not. If it's 1, say yes. If it's minus 1, say no. I claim that this is a, a, a test which uh, accept always and reject always. The fact that he accept is a little exercise. The fact that it reject is a. What is it? It's very similar to the yeah. other. Yeah, but but in fact, it's a, I'm cheating you. This is exactly if you replace plus or minus one. Okay. If you replace plus or minus one with zero one, then a big, then a, 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 you really have to think about. You, it, it, you take a symmetric matrix on. So you have a, f a, a symmetric matrix on ij. You, you should think about it as a function on the graphs, uh, on, the, on the complete graph, complete uh, graph wi on n vertices, to be, a, 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 to be a, a of the type beta times beta. It means to be a co-boundary, if you think that it. And I apply to it the co-cycle. So I apply the co-cycle test from here. And I'm using the lineal meshulam gromov theorem for that. The, the theorem that I proved you about the expansion equal 1 gives you exactly that this test is with epsilon equal 1 and with uh, checking 3 bits. OK, I don't have time. You, you can complete it. it it's trivial. I mean, it's just kind of uh, digesting the definitions. But it's kind of a cute application, because you see it's something which looks has nothing to do with expander, nothing to do with simplicial complexes. And uh, it give you and it give you a nice test for some problem that looks natural. Uh, of course, we, we look at the problem only <laughs> because we have the other. Not that we really wanted to solve it. But here is a, here is an answer. What uh, if you want to check if d is equal uh, alpha tensor beta? This doesn't answer anymore. But you can answer it by developing the theory of expansion for a cubic complexes instead of simplicial complexes. So you see, it gives you some motivation to study some geometric problem in order to solve some property testing problem. OK. 
let me still rush, I have seven minutes. Uh, okay, the, the most beautiful subject, <laughs> which I completely ignore, is the work of Gromov. A Gromov um, uh, introduced, the, uh, uh, there is an history here which the best thing that I will tell it by pictures. This, this is a, th there is a, a beautiful theorem going back to two Hungarian undergraduates at that time, Boros and Foredi, who proved the following uh, lovely result. It was in a response to a question of, uh, of uh, Erdos. You have endpoints on the, on the plane, and you draw all the possible triangles between them. So you have like n over 3 triangles between the endpoints. And then they prove that there exists a point which is covered by at least two ninth of them, minus little o. Something. Very lovely theorem in convexity. And very quickly after that, Barani proved the d dimensional version of this theorem. Gromov came with the unbelievable results, which I saw the proof now. I more or less know it. I still don't believe it's true, but it's, it seems to be true. That if you would draw the triangles in any way you want, not by straight lines, but take all the possible n over 3 points. Continuous by continuous, right. But draw it in any way, uh, 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 in any way you want. You, you, there is still a point which is covered by 2 ninths of them. In fact, he also proved that the d dimensional version of this theorem with a constant better than the constant which was known before for the f and case. Really remarkable, uh, which like, has what? Which has been improved at least after his work. After his work, I think only for the equal three, no? Also in general? No, no, in generality. Ah, what he put after the? No, for the first one. No, no. Who, who improved this? I don't know. Uh, Uli Wagner, but I think, uh, okay. Anyway, the, the, the precise constant in general is not known. Now, but what is amazing, a, a, a Gromov also completely changed the point of view. Instead of the, that we think of it as a property of R to the D, he think of it as a property of a simplicial complex. He think of it as a property, take a simplicial complex and 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 look a map from the simplicial complex to R of dimension d, look a map to, to r to the d, and the result is that there exists a point which covered by, a, by at least linear fraction of the facets, of the chambers of, the, of this. And then it and as on this become a property of a simplicial complex. Some simplicial complex will have this property, and some will not. And, and his theorem says that if you take the complete simplicial complex on, on dimension d, it has this property. Namely, there is a constant independent of n, such that every continuous map to r to the d, there will be a point which is covered by at least some linear fractions of the chambers. Now. How he proved it? He really proved, he defined this notion of expanders. And he proved that expanders in this, he didn't call it like that exactly, but that I dimensional expanders as I define them have this overlapping property, as this topological overlapping property. And therefore, the little results of lineal Meshulam and Gromov, which I tell you, is exactly what this, the little part, the deep part, is that this implies. This over this topological uh, this topological uh, overlapping. Now here in another exercise for you. Take a take a expander graph and prove that expander graph has this topological uh, overlapping property for the real. This is a trivial exercise, but to prove this property for the complete complexes is highly non-trivial. Now think about it. To prove that. The complete graphs are expanders is an exercise for a, for a seven grade uh, kids, right? To prove the, the whole issue of expander is to prove that there exists bounded degree expander. This start to be slightly non-trivial. You know, by now we have many methods, random property t, etc., etc. But uh, uh, and Gromov asks, are there bounded degree 
expanders. I dimensional expander of dimension D. And uh, 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 you can distinguish between geometric expander, and this is if you allow yourself to take only affine map, and topological expander, which is the stronger property that you allow yourself to take any continuous. Now, this was an uh, uh, open problem for a few years, and it was solved completely very recently by showing that the Ramanujan complex, uh, that the d minus 1 skeleton of the Ramanujan complexes are d minus 1 dimensional expander, uh, well, no, they are not expanders, I'm sorry. They have the topological property of Gromov, but once we have to do a twist. There is a story here which I don't have time to tell you, but just to tell you as, as a story. Last story for the last uh, two and a half minutes. This is about a quantum error correcting codes. Now, I even don't have time to define, okay. well, actually, I do have time to define them. I'll tell you what, I, I, without saying why and what, a, a quantum error correcting code of a spatial type, you know, there are maybe some other types, is the following beautiful combinatorial problem. You just look at F2 to the N, that's all, and you look at, you need, instead of a subspace, you need two subspaces here, which are orthogonal to each other, with the kind of the standard inner product over F2. And you define, so, uh, the, the religious kind of uh, uh, there is to denote them n k d, where double when n is this n, k for some reason is the following: is the dimension of w one perp divided by w two. You see, if they are orthogonal to each other, it means that w one perps contain w two, which is really equal to the dimension of W2 perp over W1, think about it, both are equal to the n minus the dimension of W1 minus the dimension of W2, that's the exercise. And the distance of them is the minimum arming weight of a vector alpha which is either in W1 perp but not in W2 or in W2 perp, but not in W1. And the, and the, and the, and the problem there, find good, good uh, quantum error correcting codes, which mean n going to infinity, and k linear in n, and d linear, linear in n. But there is an extra problem, which is there is something in coding theory which is called locally uh, uh, low density parity check code. They're, they are very important. And th th uh, the meaning of them is that the spaces are, are, d are defined, that the code is defined by, function, by, by linear functionals of a bounded length. And that's make the, the encoding uh, much, the coding, coding much easier. In particular, if it's locally testable, it must be low density parity check. In the quantum, in the classical code, the work of Sipfer Spielman was big breakthrough. They used expanders to get such codes, explicit construction, and everything. In quantum code, it's an open problem if such good LDPC code even exists, even by random method. I can explain it, but I don't have time. Uh, um, I, have, I have no time to explain it. Now, let me point out to you that, and, and now we don't need expansion. This is just the cohomology that I, the course in cohomology I gave to you, that each, each time you have, each time you have a simplicial complex, you have automatically an, 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 an quantum code. And the code is the following. You take the space, the full space V will be this CI that we will identify it for, for every I you are getting a code. And you take, W1 to be B1, and W2, you take B upper 1. Now, you remember what is, you remember what is the, what is, the, you remember I told you, what is the, the perp, what is the perp of B1, you remember? This was exactly B1 perp was Z upper 1. Right? So this K of the code is exactly 
dimension of the quotient Z1 over B1, which is exactly the dimension of the, of the cohomological group. Even more interesting, what is D of the code? D of the code is the minimum amming weight of an element which is in Z upper one, but not in B upper one. Namely, is the smallest possible a non-trivial cycle or the smallest possible non-trivial co-cycle. This is exactly the subject of systolic geometry, which has been studied by many, Gromov and others. Usually they studied over the real numbers, but everything makes sense over F2. Somehow there was not so much motivation. This gives motivation to develop systolic geometry of that kind over F2. And if you want it to be LDPC, you can also say something. Now, the work I did with Larry Good was, the, uh, uh, so this is called homological quantum error correcting yeah, codes. I mean, that's just the definition of three spaces which come from uh, Right, you just get it for free. Right, uh, there's no expansion here. I said, whenever you have a manifold or whenever you have a simplicial complex, you take a manifold, you take, uh, you take a triangulation, and you get error correcting, uh, you get quantum error correcting codes. Not not, uh, they can be trivial, for example. If the cohomology vanish, there is no space to do. If, uh, that, they can be very bad or very good, now the question. Now the point is that somebody pointed out, I think it was Kitayev, that many of the codes they constructed are special cases of that, but none of them was really good. And what the conjecture is that you cannot get good codes by this method. Now, the conjecture was even more strict. Somehow, you know, we want to get that k is approximately n, right? Like it's a, and, and d is approximately n. So we want, uh, and, and so we want that k, so for some reason there is a, you know, d appears twice here. So, the so we really want that k times d square will be something like constant n cube. The conjecture was that k uh, times d square in homological codes will be something like at most n to the 1 plus little o of 1. And we managed to beat <laughs> this conjecture by presenting, by using four-dimensional arithmetic hyperbolic manifold, some triangulation of them, which gave you 1 plus epsilon. Just a little bit more. I mean, uh, in some sense, our work is completely unimportant. It's all, but it all, it all it, because there are codes which are better than ours. But uh, it shares that, they, that they, there was an intuition why homological code cannot be good. And we, uh, but we basically showed that this intuition was incorrect. Some of the intuition was based on dimension one and on, on uh, it's, it's a story. So it put back to the race the homological code. Maybe for homological code, you can really get uh, good codes. Not that our co uh, codes are good. Anyway. In Hebrew, we say the Idach Zil Gmor, namely, this is like a crash course in cohomology, and uh, I hope at least I managed to convince some of you that it's somewhat relevant to computer science, and that's more than enough. Thank you for being patient for so long. Okay.